So in the military sphere, Russia becomes dominant. And you know, therefore, it, it can now challenge America. It can you know, challenge uh, America's hegemony in, in uh, this global position. So America sees this as a loss of influence. Besides, America faces other challenges in its own continent. And one of the things that it, it, it faces is, uh, you know, what I've mentioned, the over-concentration of capital in just one area, which is mainly Wall Street. You know, obsolete manufacturing and productive and productive capacity. Most of American factories are either obsolete or closed or abandoned because you know because of high labor costs. High labor costs forced most of the factories to move to China. You know, to move to Mexico, to move to Thailand, to move to Vietnam. Uh, Part of them had moved to Uganda. You know, Agoa is such an example. Nobody wants to produce something in America anymore because America feels it's a rich industrial nation. Everybody who comes to ask you for money, they're asking for a lot of money. So most of the manufacturing says, uh oh, we are going. And besides, innovation is in India, is in China, is in South Korea, is in Japan. So most of these industries want to locate themselves near these innovation centers. And the market is also in China, is also in Japan, is also in Russia. So America finds itself with these obsolete you know, factories, with this obsolete production capacity. Secondly, it finds itself with a crumbling infrastructure. You might not believe that most of American bridges were built 50 years ago for 50 years. Most of the American highways, you know, uh, express highways, um, interstate, you know, roads, you know, really six lanes were built 50 years ago for 50 years. Most of American sewer system, most of America's protection around rivers, uh, most of American greed. There was a time, I think, in, nine, in, in 2013, when the whole of New York was thrown out of power. You know, they had no power for three days. It's total darkness. Imagine you are in a train and you are traveling uh, from New York to some place, and all of a sudden, power goes. You know what people had to do? Come out of the train. Some of the train, they had to break glasses because the doors are electric. You come out of the train, you walk on the electric rail, you don't know where the power is coming back because you could be executed. You know, they can't communicate because there's no power. But why? All these power failures they're experiencing, America is experiencing power failures because the grid was built a long time ago and it is obsolete. Because the roads were built a long time ago, they are crumbling. Most of the pillars are broken. Most of the roads are not repaired. Most of the bridges, some were built in a hurry. Some were built with shoddy work. Some were built with wood. And things are beginning to eat, you know, to eat them. So crumbling bridges, crumbling roads, crumbling power distribution, crumbling sewers, you know, you know, you know, crumbling canals. You know, this America faces a major problem. So how does it overcome, you know, these problems? The easiest way to do this is to go to war. And when you go to war, you are seeking to diminish the power of your competitors. You are simply seeking to diminish the power of your competitors because one of the other factors affecting America is obviously a loss of market. You know, uh, they are losing market and significantly what is called in economics America's Achilles heel is the loss of the dollar, of the power of the dollar. People abandoning the dollar beginning like Russia, beginning to reserve its currency in gold. China and Russia competing to reserve their currency in gold. Iran refusing to trade oil in dollars. Venezuela doing the same. Some of these global leading powers, apart from the, the African countries, which are really politically naive, uh, Venezuela refusing to sell in dollars. Iran, one of the main conflicts between Iran and America is because Iran refuses to trade in American dollars. 
China and Russia are now exchanging their currency without going through the dollar. Uh, Russia develops its own payment system equivalent to SWIFT. Russia and China develop their own card system. Imagine a country like Uganda. I talk about the global and then maybe I reduce it you know, to Uganda and you can see how, how ridiculous you know, really our governments are. How, how weak, how thoughtless, how unstrategic you know, most of our governments are. Because even if I didn't know what to do, I'd just copy what other people are doing. You know. Now, when America loses the market, when it, other countries refuse to use their dollar, then the empire feels threatened. And it is close to 50 years, almost after 50 years, uh, because from 1945 um, is, is, uh, is when, when the war ends. So it is almost uh, when America emerges victorious and the American empire is launched almost at that time. So this is the end. We are coming to the end of the American empire. But using the slogan, they got through the USA Patriot Act, which removes many of our liberties. Nobody made a sound when we lost habeas corpus. Due process of law. And suddenly Bush managed to get rid of it. Where was a voice on television, aside from mine, that spoke out against this? Where are all those noble jurists, those great lawyers, those lovers of liberty? Where the hell were they? They were nowhere. Now we have a totalitarian government. And the totalitarian government wants to watch everybody, total surveillance of everyone. They listen to the telephone conversations. They look at your credit cards. They look where you travel. We are totally policed. This is contrary to everything in our constitution. ...with the state in response to the Sandy Hook school shooting that resulted in 26 fatalities. Connecticut passed one of the strongest gun control measures in the nation. It's estimated that only 15% of gun owners have applied for assault weapons certificates, meaning the remainder could very soon become Class D felons. Well, I think they're going to have a hard time coming, uh, putting this back in compliance, especially when precedence is already set here in Capitol Hill with our president, who is changing the laws, which he's breaking the the, national, the federal laws every day with what the, the stance that he's taking on different legislations, primarily his health care uh, plan. So people look at that and say, well, why should we abide by these laws if the president is breaking these laws? Days after and when the empire is ending, it starts major wars. It is start, starting desperately now, you know, to to look in every direction look at whoever is the competitor look at whoever is taking its market and launch the wars to weaken competition and these wars are wars of global domination so america has to do something desperate and most of what wars do or what uh, uh, how wars are started is really by what we call false flag false flag is you know to do something yourself and blame it on your enemy and convince everybody that the enemy is the one who did it. When America wanted to go in a war with Spain under the Spanish war that was fought in Cuba, America sank the Lusitania. And then they blamed Spain for sinking the Lusitania and they went to war. When America wanted to go to war with Vietnam, you know, America Viet, you know, uh, sank its own ship and then blamed Vietnam. When America um, wanted to go to war with Japan, it encouraged Japan to come and bomb Pearl Harbor, you know, and told people to remain there so it can have enough casualties. When America wanted to go to war with Afghanistan, it bombed itself, you know, in, uh, in a war at World Trade Center. You know, so now America wants to go to war with America and its allies you know, Britain and weak Britain and weak France because Britain is no longer a factor. Britain is no longer a factor. If you want to study in Britain, forget it. Don't study in Britain. If you want to study, go and study in South Africa, go and study in China, go and study in Russia, or go and study in Brazil. But do not waste your money to go and study in Britain because Britain is no longer a, a player 
on a global stage. It no longer has anything. It's, there is nothing that you are going to learn from Britain. It doesn't have money to bring to the table. It doesn't have um, innovation. It doesn't have, it's spent. You know, it's, not, it's like going to study now in Spain. Spain was once a major power. Study now in Portugal. Portugal was major, once a major power. Study now in Holland. Holland was once a major power. You don't need to go to Spain. You don't need to go to Portugal. You don't need to go to Holland. You don't need to go to, to Britain. You don't need to go to America. America no longer makes anything. You know, America is no longer a player on the global stage because the power has shifted to China. The power has shifted to Russia. A workplace the size of Monaco. For these 17,000 employees, it's reality. They come from all over China, seeking a brighter future at this factory called Yupa. <laughs> Workers craft coffee makers, irons, and electric grills in staggering quantities every single day. But Yupa is more than a steady paycheck, it's home. People get married here. They send their kids to school here. But the work never stops. Yupa's managers are on a mission to produce new products for every corner of the globe that could forever change the way we think of Made in China. Step behind the closed doors of modern China into a factory the size of a city. Welcome to the place that calls itself Factory of the World. By the time you finish watching this program, Yupa's 17,000 Chinese workers will produce nearly 20,000 electrical appliances. Every day they churn out 60,000 irons. Every month, Yupa makes 36,000 coffee bakers. That's two new machines for every Starbucks on the planet. And every year, these laborers produce a staggering 18 million electric grills. Stacked side by side, they'd span the Atlantic from New York to London. Russia and China. That is where you see the, where the empire is striking most. Who the empire is targeting. Who is complaining about. You have seen Trump's war. You know, Trump is not a fool. You know, Trump is crazy, but he's not uh, insane. You know, when you see him launching a war in America in, uh, in, against China, when you see him saying, let us pull out of the walls, because like an, a person who has a sense of reality, he wants to rebuild America. When you hear them talk about rebuild America, that tells you something. You don't rebuild something that is built. You don't rebuild something that is crumbling. So it's not crumbling. You are rebuilding a nation that has crumbled. So, here we go now. So they start all these uh, uh, chemical weapons. Chemical weapons. Syria, President Assad, gassing his own people, uh, killing his own people. At first they wanted to attack uh, in Aleppo. We wanted to stop Aleppo because... Um, in 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 20, 2013, when Obama drew a red line on Syria uh, with the so-called, you know, they have a group of people called called uh, white elements. We are mainly stooges and intelligence officers of America and Britain and France and you know in Arab in Arab faces, and they ask them to stage these chemical attacks and uh, you know film it. I I, I think we have even. Uh, a video that we posted on our Facebook page where they are rehearsing how to, start to stage these attacks. So once they do this, then they can use it as a pretext. So they wanted to use it in Aleppo, but, you know, Russia outsmarted them and managed to, um, you know, to 
defeat ISIS out of Aleppo before anything happened. So that, you know, was gone. Now they wait another, another time. When they see that really Syria, is, the President Assad is winning the war, then, and Russia is winning, then they think that once wa Russia wins in Syria, most of the Arab countries will start having a relationship with Russia. We have seen this with Qatar, Qatar which uh, has allied itself now with Iran. It has jumped ship. We have seen Turkey, you know, which is a member of NATO, having a relationship with, it's only last, you know, a few years ago, when Turkey was shooting down a Russian plane. But Russia didn't respond with war because America wants Russia to get in a war. It thinks that Russia will not use nuclear weapons. Now it wants to fight Russia so that Russia can be weakened, just like Britain was weakened, like Spain was weakened, and then America remains a dominant power. What they didn't bargain on was that America, uh, Russia was about 20, 30 years ahead technologically in weaponry. So once Putin announced that they have weapons that can bypass America's defenses, then it became, you know, something uh, horrible for America. At first they denied, but once reality sunk in, this is where to see, let us hit Russia where it hurts. The shocking reason United States destroyer Donald Cook was unable to defend itself against Russian jets last week. In fact, the entire U.S. Navy hasn't been able to since April 2014, when an exact replication of the recent incidents took place. On April 10, 2014, the US Donald Cook entered the waters of the Black Sea and on 12 April a Russian Su-24 tactical bomber flew over the vessel triggering an incident that completely demoralized its crew, so much so that the Pentagon issued a protection tracking and destruction of hundreds of targets at the same time. In addition, the US Donald Cook is equipped with four large radars, whose power is comparable to that of several stations. For protection, it carries more than 50 anti-aircraft missiles of various types. Meanwhile, the Russian Su-24 that buzzed the US Donald Cook carried neither bombs nor missiles, but only a basket mounted under the fuselage, which contained a Russian electronic warfare device called Kibani. The Russian Su-24 then simulated a missile attack against the U.S. Donald Cook, which was left literally deaf and blind. As if carrying out a training exercise, the Russian aircraft repeated the same maneuver 12 times before flying away. After that, the fourth-generation destroyer immediately set sail towards a port in Romania and according to several intelligence media websites, 27 sailors from the U.S. Donald Cook requested to be relieved from active service. Since that incident, the mainstream media has covered this up, despite widespread reaction among defense industry experts and up until this latest incident, no U.S. warship had approached Russian territorial waters since. Here's a description of the Russian Air Force's Kibani device from the manufacturer's webpage. The Russian Air Force Kibani is an advanced aircraft-mounted electronic warfare system capable of jamming state-of-the-art radar-based weapon systems. It consists of a small torpedo-shaped wingtip pod covering the aircraft with a radio electronic protective hood once a missile attack has been detected. The protective hood prevents the missile from reaching the target and makes it deviate from the course. According to KRET Corporation, the Kibani increases the aircraft's survivability by 25 to 30 times. This pod development is the result of the lessons learned during the conflict with Georgia in 2008 where all the aircraft lost were not fitted with a new system which is the main cause of them being shot down. The Kibani jamming system was tested successfully for some time on the ground in Beriasia, Russian Federation. The Russian Air Force plans call for the installation of the Kibani jammer on all its advanced jets such as Su-38M, Su-30M2, Su-34 and Su-35. The Kibani 10 volts is a version installed internally instead of the wingtips. Slightly ironically, I made a comment on my own video covering the incident. Something along the lines of not so sure shouting loudly is going to work too well when it comes to defending your ships from Russian jets guys. Guns usually work much better and I still stand by that statement. You guys are funny, bringing a knife to a gunfight and shit. The Russian Air Force don't even need bombs. They could save quite a few rubles if they swapped bombs for lowering Mr. Putin from a helicopter armed with a tin opener. So, this case of, the, of, 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 of Britain where they accuse Russia of using uh, you know, biological weapons in, in Britain. But remember, I, I always told you about biological weapons. Some of you thought they didn't exist. Now it appears that almost every country in Europe 
you know, other factory that makes biological weapons, including pot and down. But you can see, you know, how they fake it and they said, okay, you know, it's so lethal, nobody will leave. You know, and then they say, you know, they have recovered. You know, but then they use it now to put sanctions on Russia, to chase away Russian spies, and, and they are putting pressure so that they can draw Russia into a war. They sought to draw Russia into a war in Ukraine, but Russia escaped. They shot to take over Crimea so they can surround it with Russia, but Russia again escaped and took Crimea with it. So even this, you know, really what they were seeking to say is to Arab countries, you have no protection. We will come after you whether you are with Russia or not. But thankfully what happened was, you know, the Syrian army showed that it can use Russian weapons, old weapons, to defeat. What I didn't know um, until recently, was the size of a cruise missile. A cruise missile is almost like a small pickup truck that travels at very small speed in the air. Like this tomahawk, you can almost see it in the sky. So it's not very difficult to hit even with an AK-47, except when you hit it, then it could explode on your head. You know, something would happen. So most of the armies don't want to do that because when they see it passing through their street, you know you'll shoot it, but you know, you also get killed. But that has, ex you know, why am I, you know, talking about Syria? Why am I talking about Russia? What's that got to do with us? So if I bring it back to Uganda, uh, what is happening to Uganda, to Kenya, to Tanzania? What is happening in these countries? You have seen the complete uh, recolonization of Africa, complete recolonization, uh, where America is the colonial power that rules these countries. Our presidents are really colonial governors ruling under the hegemony of America. Our leadership is frightened of America, completely frightened. Most of what America did was to rob these, they are not waging direct war, they are waging soft war. They are waging hidden wars, mostly with information and social media and breaking down the social structure and, you know, creating opposition between peoples, between regions, between regions, and buying off a, a, an elite, an African elite, and winning it over towards America by scholarship, you know, by confusing the army with scholarships and promotion and training in uh, American institutions, and introducing laws like uh, ICC, you know, where now if a president gives an order, a general has to first think, what if they took me to ICC? So, and one of the things that they successfully did, particularly in a country like Uganda, was to reduce the government's capacity to talk back. Come December 13th, 2013, should the government digital migration plan proceed as is, 90% of Kenyans will be unable to view their favorite local channels. This is because the switch to digital will entail the mandatory use of setup boxes to convert the signal from analog to digital to access channels on the digital platform. Now here's the catch. Only 26,000 set-up boxes are universal. That means they can access all local stations. And so for the estimated 8 million TV owners in Kenya, they will use different sets of set-up boxes and they are not free. And because it is possible, different local stations will broadcast from different signal carriers controversially licensed by the government, it will mean a viewer may have to purchase as many as three set-up boxes, each at approximately 5,000 Kenya shillings. That means you will pay about 15,000 Kenya shillings, and besides, there will be an additional monthly subscription fee. So when the consumers' lobby group COFEC and West Media sought to be enjoined in the case, these are some of the things they were considering. What this means is that they are now part of an application by national media houses, Royal Media Services, Nation Media Group and Standard Group in their application. 
Now, the three national media houses want the process put on hold, arguing they stand to suffer huge financial loss if the government goes ahead with its plan to switch off all analog TV frequencies in Nairobi and its environs starting December the 13th. How? Well, the government has issued a license to four companies, three of whom are foreign, while the other, KBC, is in partnership with another foreign firm to distribute the signal and licenses, and thereby effectively locking out local media houses that had also applied for the license and signal distribution rights. The local media has raised concerns that placing a key national asset predominantly in the hands of foreigners poses strategic and sovereignty concerns. Fundamentally, the media houses have also pointed out that the government move essentially contravenes Article 34 of the Constitution that gives the right to establishment. The question is, how are the media houses set to migrate without the necessary licenses and signals? And why such a vital resource is being placed at the control of foreigners? The main media stations are also worried that the rushed migration will cause them major financial losses as it will force them to invest in new technology while abandoning current transmission infrastructure costing billions of shillings. The question is, why can't they be granted the digital transmission license to enable them upgrade their current systems, thereby saving on already existing investments? The application was filed as urgent to stop the service providers from using their licenses or agents from broadcasting, distributing and interfering with their programs, copyrighted material and productions which would then infringe on the intellectual property of the petitioner. So here's what the media houses are proposing. That they be allowed to be given the licenses and signals and that the government put the migration on hold until 30th June 2014. This will include time for the government to make arrangements to subsidize the set-up boxes and to allow the infrastructure be set in place. And that instead of rushing the digital migration, a dual elimination process should be used. This will mean that the digital and analog signals will run concurrently as the framework is put in place. It is important to note that the switch-off should not be implemented before a sufficient number of television viewers have acquired the universal set-up boxes. If not, Kenya is likely to go the way of Tanzania that began the migration on 31st December 2013, but halted the second phase since 50% of Tanzanian TV owners could not access the TV services. The same in South Africa, where the subsidizing of set-up boxes halted the process. By introducing digital migration, with digital migration now in every home, BBC can speak. In every home, Al Jazeera can speak. In every home, CNN can speak. But what is absent is Ugandan voices, independent voices, indigenous voices. Those have gone. And our leadership, including our president, are so blind that they can't see you know, the, the empire fights a war in such a way that by the time the leadership wakes up, it is all over. By the time the leadership wakes up, the war is over. Right now, when the president speaks, he assumes that people are listening. But they are not. They are not. You know, they might turn on some television and, uh, you know, see a clip, but most people are sacked. Our women are sacked on these Telemundo channels and soaps. And these soaps are really imaginative unreality. Imaginative unreality. Where they imagine that they live somewhere utopia. Some kind of animal farm sugar candy mountain. Some kind of a trio search for the nothing. Where everything is rosy. You know, all you need to care about is who loves you and when they will not call you and when they break up a relationship. All you need to care about is who doesn't like you, who loves you, who doesn't like you, um, what will happen when you have a lot of money and, you know, this one has cheated you in a deal and... It's not problems of what to eat, problems of where to live, problems of where to work. It is not
problems of how to protect your nation state, of how you could be invaded. No. It is not problems of who runs the bank, who controls the money, where your money comes from. No. Those are not the problems that they show you on these Telemundo channels, that they show you in these American movies that are promoting homosexuality, that are promoting bestiality, that are promoting... So eroding the social fabric. But the nation is obsessed with what? Most of our leaders are obsessed with trying to make the nation work first so that the small number of civil servants get paid. You will recall that we have stated before that with a population of more than 40 million, Uganda's budget, about 60% of Uganda's budget, goes to pay 1% of the population that are employed by government in salaries and expenditure. 1%, not 99%, no, 1%. So, most of the governments are interested in making this corrupt system because that is the ultimate form of corruption where government employs only 1% of its population and they take 60%. Forget about any other corruption. There is nothing more corrupt than European governments. I was reading and I can, I can show you this that uh, in, in Europe, the EU, 300 billion is lost every year in corruption. 300 billion, bigger than the EU's budget is lost all in corruption. So, you know, when you talk about corruption, you know, it's bigger there than here. But the biggest corruption is, where does the budget go? It goes to feed that 1% in salaries and expenditure. Then what the small that remains now goes to build roads. Where does the money for roads go? To the Chinese, and sometimes the Israelis, and sometimes the Italians. Where does the money for railways go? To the Italians, to the Spaniards, to the Chinese. Where does money for computers go? To the Chinese and the Japanese. Where does money for communication and uh, go? To the British, to the Americans, to the Japanese. And the Americans don't give us anything. They don't even trade with us. Our trade with America is less than 17 million. The, the aid they give us is for we are going to train your soldiers, we are going to give you scholarships, or we are going to give you a couple of weapons. Where does money for, our, for the defense go? To the Chinese, to the Russians, to the Americans, to the British, to the Israelis. Where does money for school go? To the British. They are the ones that surprise us with the books. They are the ones that gave us the curriculum of global domination. To the British, they are the ones that hijack our money for scholarships and force our children to study in their institutions. And incidentally, government believes that if you studied in Britain, you are really well off or better off or you know something. Here in East Africa, unfortunately, the situation is not good. And the reason is there is, poor, there is very poor linkage between uh, the academia who are able to do research and produce innovations and inventions and the private sector. Professor Muyunga Kunya, the Executive Secretary of the Inter-University Council of East Africa, consequently adds that this scenario is hampering graduate employability. We need to change such that the demand side is determining what kind of curriculum is offered in universities. Once we do that, I can assure you some of the challenges that we are facing in employability, entrepreneurship, and so on and so forth, lack of confidence, and uh, this will be uh, historical. The so, our money goes to our colonial masters. Our money goes to our colonial masters. Hardly any of it remains for us. All the contracts goes to the colonial masters. When the master speaks, we spend. 
When the master cries, we give him a handkerchief. We are a colony, a perfect colony. Uganda is a colony of the United States. And their cousins, the British, our presidents in Kenya, in Britain, in, in Nigeria, in Tanzania, are so terrified of Britain, of America, of France. And should I tell you something? When you go into State House of Uganda or State House of Kenya or State House of Congo, it is all full of white people. This white man wants to sell the president this. That white man wants to get the president to do this. This white man wants to get the president to do that. And our president called them sisters, brothers, friends. This, I am telling you, this is a colony. It is worse a colony than before independence. Because at least before independence, our chiefs knew that they were a colony and told everybody that they are a colony. Whereas our chiefs now pretend that they are not a colony when they are a colony. In other words, they shelter the real colonizer, the United States of America. Now, let me tell you something else. Uganda's money is backed by the American dollar. Uganda's money. Most of Uganda's money, I've told you, is produced by commercial banks. Almost 12 trillion by commercial banks. The central bank in Uganda has only done 5 trillion. The rest of the money is produced by telecom companies. Now, when the telecom companies produce the money, Uganda loses because somebody else is producing this money instead of government. But guess what? Ugandan money is backed in dollars. When Uganda produces gold and Uganda has a lot of gold passing through Uganda, which is worth 8 billion US dollars, instead of Uganda buying that gold and using it to protect its currency, to reserve its currency, just like Britain has done, just like Russia has done, Britain reserves its currency. It's to a certain amount. Ounces traded on electronic exchanges. There may not be even one ounce of real gold backing it up. The term Ponzi scheme comes up. The customer or client thinks he or she has something, but doesn't. There's not a lot of it. All the gold ever found would only create a cube 70 feet by 70. Even melted down. It's just enough to fill three Olympic swimming pools. Yet gold's magic continues to keep us in its thrall. Because a dollar is a piece of paper, you also have a piece of paper. So what is it? Why would you reserve a piece of paper with another piece of paper? What? And you know the dollar is collapsing. Because America is not producing anything. Because other people are dumping the dollar. The only thing keeping the dollar now is China. So America can talk about China, can talk about sanctions in China, can talk about the coming war with China. Yes, they will fight a war with China. They will first want to fight a war with Russia. They are hoping that Russia will not use nuclear weapons. But Russia has already stated clearly that we shall use nuclear weapons if our friends are threatened. Our allies are threatened. We we'll use nuclear weapons. And Russia now doesn't even need to use nuclear weapons because they have got smart weapons, not like the obsolete American weapons. Now you ask yourself, you have seen that Russia has stood with Syria. Syria was about to collapse. The rebels were in Damascus. Can you believe? In the capital city. It's like you're in Nairobi and they're already in Chibera or in some place. It's like they're already in Dar es Salaam. They have taken almost a significant part of Damascus and Russia intervened. The mistake that Libya did because the Libyan president couldn't also be advised. He was like most presidents that I know who assume they know everything. When you are talking to them, they... 
You know, they look at you and say, well, how come you are not the president if you are so clever? You know? How come if you knew that we are the people sitting here, you are sitting there? They say that. They say that because they are president, they are wise. And they have been in power for a long time, they are wiser. Because all the countries now should be running to ally themselves with the Russians. Now, you know, when Kiran Kuba talks about allowing himself with a white person or a white nation, you know, really. But let me tell you this. This empire of chaos, this American empire, we might fight like Vietnam, but the amount of chaos that it would cause would be devastating. And frankly, I don't even know whether we are prepared to fight it. Why? America now has over 16 military bases in Africa. They have a center they set up to command Africa. They have even a military base in Uganda. Oh, yes. What you call UN bases are nothing but American bases. They have a base in Sudan. They have a base in Ethiopia. They have a base in Djibouti. They have a base in Ghana, a base in Congo. When you hear them fighting now in Niger, these Arabs 